Chapter 32, King of Diamonds, King of Spades. Bombs had been going off all over Paris for weeks. While the French Intifada took credit for the blasts, it made no public demands. As the frequency and randomness of attacks grew, so did French suspicion of every person of color in France. When a synchronized assault by Allied Sub-Saharan, North African, European, and Latin forces simultaneously blitzed and destroyed multinational corporate buildings, arms manufacturers, and mining camps across multiple continents, Europeans were caught entirely flat-footed. Heavily armed initiates overran unsuspecting, ill-prepared security forces on a variety of fronts. Absolutely no one had anticipated the revolutionaries who'd sprung fully formed from the head of Europe's black frustration. Nobody knew exactly what to expect. The group's manifesto was a curious document demanding the broad and vague objective of dismantling global white oppression. Then, as frequently happens on the world stage, by providence, the initiative's cause was aided when the Turks unexpectedly joined the efforts against the French. The Turks didn't empathize with the Intifada's objectives so much as they sought to advance their own geopolitical agenda. And again, the enemy of my enemy. Having substantially increased the velocity of the European theater's forward trajectory, the initiative focused its attention on Anglos and Germans in Africa. The initiative was insulted that German was still spoken in Namibia and indignant that African countries were still under British rule or occupation. They detested Caucasian hedge money, period. Recognizing the Herculean effort that their aspirations would require, they had no illusions about the carnality that would follow. But unlike the metric used by the Europeans to determine success, the African eye wasn't always on the bottom line. They were ready to do whatever it took to get the job done once and forever. De Beers Diamonds, the British multinational mining company founded by super colonizer Cecil John Rhodes, was a prime target. Rhodes hailed from privileged beginnings in Hertfordshire, England, and as a young man was sent by his family to South Africa in the hope that the climate would improve his poor health. It's not clear how much the climate helped him in so much as he died relatively young at the age of 48. But before he died, Rhodes had established the nation of Rhodesia, the largest diamond mining company in the world, the most renowned academic scholarship in history, and the colony he headed for six years in the 1890s would eventually become the nation of South Africa. During his short lifetime, Rhodes had also contributed to the deaths of over 60 million Africans. Add to the fact that the royal family of the British Empire, through the efforts of Rhodes and others like him, had amassed a personal fortune of more than $150 billion. Not only did the Queen subsist on an annual stipend of $107 million and live in a $5 billion house, but she'd done it all while almost 80% of the Congo, on whose back she profited, subsisted on less than $2 a day. The initiative intended to change all that. The royal family's diamond income is separate and apart from its revenue generated from the so-called Gold Coast. Although the name stemmed from the European traders who flocked to the area in pursuit of the prize mineral, the coast had its beginnings in the slave trade. The four national territories in West Africa that make up the area are controlled by the British Crown. Chief among the region's major assets is in Penang. At a depth of almost two and a half miles, in Penang is the deepest gold mine in the world. Located near the town of Carltonville, South Africa, it became a prime initiative target for takeover. The initiative didn't care solely for the gold. Their aim was to control all the minerals in Africa. Because of the long history of African sellouts, initiative members pragmatically adhered to a brutal protocol. Anyone revealed to be an informant would die on the spot, and entire families would be erased from memory. In addition, there were no white operatives in the African theater. The order was, to eliminate on contact any European who presented themselves as a friend. Likewise, the Chinese. The initiative understood that the Chinese would not see black nationalism as being in their best interest. The best hope for black people was for Africans to control Africa. In the meantime, the British King of Diamonds' hand was being offset by the initiative's possession of all the spades. In order to achieve their objectives, 
the initiative was prepared to throw as many coals on the fire as necessary. In a war of attrition, they liked their chances. Their tactics varied according to necessity. The aim of engagement in the African theater was threefold. One, take control of precious metal and mineral mining operations. Two, capture and if necessary, destroy manufacturing plants. Three, completely disrupt the status quo through general strikes. They would need collateral against inevitable unbridled pushback. Gold mining magnate Ernst Schnitzel was the first abduction. Schnitzel, who was among the biggest goldfish in the pond, was grabbed in full view of patrons attending his annual Learn to Think charity fundraiser. Black tie attendees were stunned when the initiates burst into the ballroom and snatched Schnitzel off the stage at the private club hosting the event. De Beers' diamond head Robert Carver was next. After his abduction, top-level executives became extremely difficult to find. When thousands of armed natives overran diamond and gold mining camps, security forces had been caught literally off guard, most commonly because they never remotely suspected any such thing as mass revolt would ever take place. The sheer number of natives completely overwhelmed security forces who generally surrendered after offering only tepid resistance. Oil fields and textile plants experienced similar fates. African operatives working inside targeted objectives easily outmaneuvered their underestimating overseers, allowing the initiative unfettered access to every type of facility. Following the initial breaching of a target, compliance by black employees was self-administered. Africans who didn't want to take part in the actions simply walked away. Diamonds held a special interest for the initiative. A distinctive feature of the world diamond market is its high monopolization. The largest mining companies, De Beers among them, take out 70% of all the world's diamonds. Based on industry estimates, the global demand for diamonds would soon exceed the volumes of proposal. Based on the forecast, diamond production would also decrease due to lack of new deposits, all of which meant prices would skyrocket. Matters worsened when it was discovered that mines and oil fields had been booby-trapped. Knowing the initiative could destroy entire operations with the push of a single button, put pressure on magnates and heads of state to negotiate. Thank you.